One of the worst days in a surgeon's life is when a patient dies. Depending on their specialty, some surgeons have to confront this reality more often than others. I'm Dr. Chris Rayner, orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine physician, and today in turns, our topic is going to be a little bit more serious than usual. Instinctively, you may guess that surgeons who deal with the heart, brain, lungs, or other vital organs come face to face with death most often since these organs are impossible to live without. But the answer is more nuanced than that. Let's compare three examples. First, a 2021 study in the Journal of Thoracic Disease recorded an operative mortality in patients of various cardiac operations performed on the heart or the great blood vessels of 2.2%. That's 246 out of 11,190 patients. The majority of these deaths occurred within 30 days of the procedure while the patients were still at the hospital, though a small percentage occurred later. Second, a 2002 study in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery showed the rate of acute mortality within 30 days after inpatient orthopedic surgical procedures to be approximately 1% for all patients. As you might expect, since orthopedic surgeons deal primarily with bones, joints, ligament, muscles, tendons, and nerves but not vital organs. But in the same study, the rate of acute mortality was 3.1% for patients with a hip fracture and 0.5% for patients without a hip fracture. That's peculiar. Why would surgery for a hip fracture have a higher mortality than heart surgery? Well, typically, the population of individuals who require surgery to fix a fractured hip belong to an older age demographic and or lead a more sedentary lifestyle, thus presenting with more comorbidities than people in other demographics. A frail elderly person may have poor lean muscle mass, poor muscular control, poor eyesight, and poor sensation in their feet due to diabetes. All of these factors increase the likelihood that they will suffer a fall. They may also suffer from osteoporosis, a degenerative disease that develops when bone mineral density and bone mass decreases, or when the structure and strength of bone changes. Side note. The most common cause of osteoporosis is inactivity, though this process can be exacerbated by poor nutrition. It is sometimes referred to as a silent disease, because people who develop it may not notice any changes until a bone breaks. A frail elderly person with pre-existing comorbidities is generally less resilient and the risk of mortality is higher for any surgical procedure. In medicine, the phrase circling the drain is sometimes thrown around. Please excuse the morbid humor. Medical professionals use it as a coping mechanism. This term refers to a person with many comorbidities who is approaching death. This is a crude snapshot of someone's proximity to death, and we can use it to estimate the efficacy of a procedure and the likelihood that a patient will suffer. Often, medical professionals are tasked with providing care for people who are circling said drain, or close to death, and our job is to make the patient, family members, and care providers aware of this situation. Age is not the only factor contributing. A patient may also be medically frail as a result of one or possibly several concurrent chronic medical diseases or conditions that severely curtail an individual's ability to thrive, such as poorly controlled diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, heart failure, or renal failure, just to name a few. Our job requires us to confront grim realities on a day-to-day -day basis. When a person with many comorbidities requires surgery, there is a heightened chance of mortality even when all aspects of the surgery go as planned. And when things don't go as planned? Well, let's consider our third example. In 2013, a study published in the Journal of Neurosurgery showed the 30-day mortality rate was 26.4% in traumatically brain-injured patients undergoing decompressive craniectomy. Why do you think the probability of mortality associated with this procedure is so freaking high? A decompressive craniectomy involves removing a piece of the skull to relieve intracranial pressure after a traumatic brain injury or stroke that is unresponsive to conventional treatment modalities. This type of brain surgery is reserved for patients who will die without intervention. The surgery is inherently more dangerous and typically performed against the clock as a last ditch effort to save a life. The greatest difference between the first two examples and the third are the elements of trauma and emergency. Many surgeries, though they deal with the vital organs, permit the surgeon ample time to prepare for the operation and are performed under carefully controlled conditions. 
Even recipients of a heart transplant have a more favorable mortality rate than this, as approximately 85 to 90% of heart transplanted patients are living one year after their surgery, with an annual death rate of approximately 4% thereafter. When the patient has suffered a traumatic injury, there are many more variables outside of the surgeon's control, including time factors, stress, the difficulty of the procedure, the amount of blood loss associated with the injury, the presence of open injuries that communicate with the external environment, and the level of care the patient has received prior to the definitive treatment. Doctors refer to the NCEO pod, or National Confidential Inquiry into Patient Outcomes and Death, to classify the types of surgery as immediate, within minutes, urgent, within hours, expedited, within days, and elective, planned. Generally speaking, the more emergent a surgery, the higher the mortality and the mortality rate associated with it, not even considering the injury that the surgery is intended to treat. There are exceptions, however, such as a testicular torsion, which occurs when a testicle rotates on the spermatic cord, twisting the spermatic cord and the arteries that bring blood to the testicles within the scrotum. Here, the urgency pertains to the time window for possible salvage and survival of a twisted testicle, commonly thought to be about six to eight hours, and not the mortality of the patient. An article published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery in 2019 explains that in the United States, trauma is the third leading cause of death among persons of all age groups, accounting for 208,557 deaths in 2015, and approximately 37 million emergency room visits every single year. The same article shares another sobering statistic. Overall, mortality rates in patients admitted to emergency for acute cardiac trauma was 35.7%, 51.9% in penetrating, and 26.3% in blunt injuries. If we circle back to our first example and compare this number to the mortality rate in patients undergoing cardiac surgery, there is obviously a large discrepancy, 35.7 versus 2.2% mortality. All this to say that immediate and urgent traumatic injuries create a situation where the odds are stacked against the patient and the surgeon. In the medical profession, we may well consider the survival rate with and without surgical intervention instead of the mortality rate of a given surgery. Without surgery, you die. With surgery, you might survive even though the surgery has a 35% risk of mortality. I'm not trying to boil down life and death simply to a math equation, but this is the simplest way to put it. Let's recap. The majority of surgery related deaths occur in populations with pre-existing comorbidities, that is to say those who are already circling the drain, patients who have suffered severe trauma and require emergency care. I must also mention that deaths do occur as a result of preventable medical error, which could be on the part of the surgeon or the anesthetist. I plan to speak more about this in a future video, but for now, a 2019 meta-analysis of the latest research showed around one in 20 patients are exposed to preventable harm in medical care. This statistic encompasses all types of medical care and all types of harm. And of that 5%, 12% of preventable patient harm was severe or led to death. Pop quiz, what's 12% of 6%? Let me know in the comments down below. For those of you who don't like math, it's not very likely. But as part of our training, we are prepared for every outcome. So if something goes wrong and the patient dies, well, a 2016 article in the British Medical Journal has our answer. After the death of a patient, a doctor may need to prepare a report for a significant event investigation or the coroner, or attend an inquest as a witness. The family may make a complaint, take legal action, or refer the doctor to the General Medical Council, or whichever organization grants medical certification in their country. As you'd expect, when death occurs on your watch, you will be thoroughly questioned, the case examined by your governing body, and you may have to face legal action, not to mention the emotional toll. Doctors are often described as frigid or robotic, and when the shit hits the fan, sometimes we have to be. But we often grow attached to our patients, and as cold as we can be, we really want to keep you alive. As a medical student, my first experience with death was heartbreaking. I was shadowing a general surgeon, and one of the patients on our floor was a cantankerous old man who was a 100-pack-year smoker. 
The term pack years is a way to measure the amount a person has smoked over a long period of time. It is calculated by multiplying the number of packs of cigarettes smoked per day by the number of years the person has smoked. BMC Public Health breaks it down for us. Zero pack years, never smoked. One to 20 pack years, light smokers. One to 40 pack years, moderate smokers. More than 40 pack years, heavy smokers. As far as smoking goes, this man was a super heavyweight. They're gonna give you all the reasons why smoking cigarettes is not good for you. They're gonna talk about all the chemicals in your body and how it closes down capillary absorption and all types of shit. And they're gonna like try to use information. Something like one and a half packs a day since he was five. He told me a story about his childhood in the UK when you could give the clerk at the corner store 10 cents and they would give you one cigarette in exchange. During his month long stay at my hospital, we talked about all kinds of things, laughing together as I treated and stabilized him. Unfortunately, despite all treatments, his health continued to decline. Sometimes there is very little that medicine can do. And other times there is absolutely nothing that medicine can do. In both cases, communication is paramount. You'll have to tell the family what they're dealing with, which is not really an easy job. You'll inform them about the probability of mortality and what possible options remain, if any still do. When there are some options, a family may push to prolong the life of their loved ones as long as possible, which puts the doctor in a difficult position. We develop the ability to remain calm so that we can consider the desire of the patient and their quality of life. The hospital will also factor in the cost of keeping them alive, which you may not want to hear, but it is the truth. Sometimes this may lead to a do not resuscitate order, which basically means that we will do everything we can to make a patient comfortable, but we will not perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR if a patient stops breathing or their heart stops beating. The reality of performing CPR on a patient who is sickly, elderly, frail, or all of these things combined is very brutal. It is not like you see on TV. Okay, too fast. Everyone, we need to pump at a pace of 100 beats per minute. Oh, okay. That's uh, hard to keep track. How many is that per hour? When I ask a family what they want to do, I am sure to convey this fact in my questioning. Question number one, do you consent to us performing forceful chest compression to resuscitate your parent? Typically, when a patient is to be resuscitated, an orderly or a hospital attendant whose job consists of assisting medical and nursing staff with various nursing and medical interventions will climb on top of the bed, straddle the patient's chest, and perform chest compressions manually by pressing forcefully down on the heart muscle often breaking several ribs in the process. Some places have a machine for this, but most hospitals do this the old fashioned way. Question number two, do you consent to us shocking your parent several times with a defibrillator to initiate the heartbeat? Man, I feel like I'm missing something. Yeah, using that AED would be amazing right about now. The AED or automated external defibrillator emits a quick, powerful electric shock anywhere between 120 to 200 joules. Johns Hopkins Medicine tells us those who experienced a defibrillator shock say it's painful. And some studies suggest that the shock can even damage the heart muscle. As I mentioned, this is done several times. Electricity doesn't flow perfectly through our skin, fat, bone, etc. And the first shock is meant to break down our tissue's resistance to the electrical flow. A second will follow and maybe even a third. Question number three, do you consent to us sticking a breathing tube down their throat and putting them on a ventilator? A ventilator is a machine that helps you breathe or breathes for you. When this is necessary, a healthcare provider will insert an endotracheal tube or an ET tube through the patient's mouth and into their windpipe or trachea. This form of life support uses positive pressure to force air into your lungs. Like you have a small leaf blower down your throat. By contrast, normal breathing uses negative pressure. Just open your mouth and the air flows in. Unfortunately, mechanical ventilation comes with several risks. Firstly, the breathing tube that is put into your airway can allow bacteria and viruses to enter your lungs and as a result, cause pneumonia, which is a type of lung infection that causes the air sacs or alveoli of the lungs to fill up with fluid or pus. The patient cannot talk or eat with the tube in their throat. Ventilator induced lung injury or 
villi may also occur and result in pulmonary edema, barotrauma, and worsening hypoxemia that can prolong mechanical ventilation, lead to multi-system organ dysfunction, and increase mortality. It sounds brutal because it is. And it is important for the family of a dying patient to be made aware of everything involved with keeping a patient alive. My own father had issues relating to his cancer, and I remember talking to the oncologist who told me that the cancer had spread. He told me that we were not going to be able to beat this. Over time, my father deteriorated and was admitted to the hospital where he was put on a BiPAP machine, which is a type of positive pressure ventilator that assists breathing while the patient wears a mask. It is non-invasive, that is to say, not intubated, and uses dual pressure settings, higher during inhalation, lower during exhalation, to allow patients to inhale and exhale more air out of the lungs. It's like a ventilator's little brother and may sometimes prolong the time until ventilation finally becomes necessary. We were faced with the reality that he was never going to get off BiPAP and the next step was going to be a ventilator. I remember clearly the look of fright that he had on his face while on that BiPAP machine. And unfortunately, I was the one that had to tell him that however long that he was going to live, he was never going to get off that. I imagined what would happen if he were to suffer a cardiac arrest. I pictured the staff running into the room, the orderly compressing his chest, and my mother in sheer panic. It was, and still is, terrifying. These are the realities that we confront in the hospital. So I, as the power of attorney, sat there with my father and my family as he passed. I really love my father. Just know that beyond a doctor's calm, cool exterior, there is a profound depth of feeling first-hand experience, and a desire to help and heal. When emotions run high, heroic decisions, when not taken with all of the facts in mind, can cause a patient and a family more pain. If you liked the video, be sure to let us know and subscribe to the channel. If you didn't, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, and teach one.